This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. This afternoon's lecture is part of the History Department's year-long focus on the theme, Bodies and Evidence, a theme that allows us to consider how bodies are used as sources of information and evidence in science, medicine, and law, and the implications for knowledge, ethics, and law. That evidence collected from the body is usually considered to be incontrovertible, better and more reliable than any other source, what someone says, remembers, or finds through deep research in the archives. We are all increasingly subject to this type of physical scrutiny and collection of information from our bodies through DNA collection, fingerprinting, and photographing for identification. But suspect classes and peoples are more likely to have their bodies used as sources of evidence through mandatory DNA collection of all prisoners, strip searches, automatic testing of poor black pregnant women for narcotics. This scrutiny, that's all in the present. <laughs> This scrutiny of the body for evidence is not new, nor is the focus on the stigmatized and less powerful um, new. Furthermore, today's practices are often directly copied from past procedures. Our speaker today uh, brings our attention to the historical scrutiny of the prostitute's body across the British Empire. Professor Philippa Levine is Mary Helen Thompson Centennial Professor in the Humanities at the University of Texas, Austin. She earned her um, degrees at Oxford St. Anthony's College and has been awarded numerous fellowships, including the Guggenheim, uh, a resident fellow at Bellagio, the Hewlett, Hewlett Foundation, NIH, the American Council of Learned Societies, and many more. Um, Professor Levine's first books are on the Victorian feminism and Britain. And um, she may tell us more about these stories, but she is more in recent years, turned to looking at the empire, um, something we learned was rather unusual from somebody who was actually educated in the middle of the empire in, the, in London uh, herself. Um, and today's talk is based on her brilliant book, Prostitution, Race, and Politics, The British Empire, which looks across four colonies, uh, looking at Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and India. And this is one of the things that made this, uh, this book and her talk here so exciting and brings together so many different people because she actually compares so many different places at once and is able to see the differences and similarities among them. Her new works include, um, her works in progress uh, include The Empire Has No Clothes, Nakedness, Colonialism, and Spectacle and Evolution, Eugenics, and Empire. She also has a, a recent collection um, of articles uh, of eugenics around the world, which we're waiting for the library to get a hold of. Um, I want to thank the Miller Committee, especially for its sponsor sponsorship of Philippa Levine's talk tonight and her visit as George A. Miller Visiting Professor, um, in addition to all of the co-sponsors, which I will not go through, but they do represent the range of the humanities and sciences and the globe. Thank you, too, to our staff, Tom Bedwell and Janet Abramson, who have made this possible. Um, I also want to let you know that uh, we will be having another talk in this series in April uh, with historian of Japan David Howell, um, and we will be having a second talk with uh, Professor Levine tomorrow titled Making Difference, Race, Sex, and Science in the 19th Century. 
Um, tell your friends and students, and especially those in sciences who maybe think they don't belong here, that they should come tomorrow to that talk at 4 p.m. in room 160 of the English building. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our George A. Miller Visiting Professor of History, Philippa Levine. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, for that lovely introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? Good, great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's a, a wonderful theme for the kind of work in which I'm interested. The history of imperialism was once a rather dull affair, focused on skirmishes and diplomacy, rambling memoranda sent by stolid officials in colonial outposts to their senior colleagues entrenched at the India and colonial offices. There was a good reason to avoid its study for those of us training as British historians in the 1980. Today, things look very different, and the so-called new imperial history, a term I don't find particularly appealing but use here as a shorthand, has insisted upon cultural and social readings, on attending to discourse and language, to knowledge and power, not only as these were transmitted from Britain to its colonies, but between colonies and from the empire back to Britain as well. Such investigations have also led us to consider not only the more usual forms of political power, the army, the vote, the corridors of Whitehall, but allow us to see where and how political authority and power may reside in areas which more traditionally have been relegated to the private rather than the public sphere. Today, I want to take up both these challenges, focusing on questions of sexuality in the British Empire at the height of its power. I hope to show how untraditional avenues of power and control on the one hand and colonial responses to such control on the other shaped and influenced the making of policy on the ground, that is, in these imperial arenas themselves. While the control and management of sexuality in the empire is apparent in a whole host of colonial policies and laws, my concern today is with the highly controversial legislation of the mid and late 19th century, which brought the sale of sex under government supervision. It was, as you will appreciate, not palatable for a Victorian government made up of eminently respectable men to speak openly and to discuss such definitively private issues as sexual congress and, even more unfortunate, sexually transmissible diseases. Yet the rising rate of venereal diseases, more especially in the military, upon whom the growth and control of empires so heavily relied, made it an unavoidable and often an urgent topic among politicians and policymakers. Distasteful it might be, avoidable it was not. With infection rates for syphilis and gonorrhea hovering not infrequently above 200 per thousand of troop strength, something had to be done. Then, as now, the tendency to equate active sexuality with the contraction of venereal diseases was common, and the focus in the 19th century was commonly on the female prostitute whose distance from the norms of respectability and acceptability made her an easy target for blame. In Britain and its colonies, women earning their livelihood by selling sex were regarded, not surprisingly, with great distaste, even while their services were constantly in demand. But prostitution was also emblematic of all that the British found worrying about their colonial subjects. Not only did prostitution allegedly demonstrate the fundamental immorality of colonial peoples, but its consequences, especially in putting military strength at risk, destabilized imperial authority. It was imperative in the Victorian Empire that this manifestation of native licentiousness be brought to heel. As a result, in the late 19th century, colonial contagious diseases, or CD laws, would be found the length and breadth of the empire. Designed, as were their British counterparts, to stem a perceived rise in syphilis and gonorrhea rates by controlling the body of the female prostitute, women working in the sex trade faced a degree of management by government authorities which severely contradicted Britain's favorite rhetoric about its love of and respect for individual liberty. Not surprisingly, such laws were far more coercive and far more intrusive in their colonial than in their domestic guise. Far from being modeled on the allegedly parent legislation of the mother country, where only a handful of garrison and naval towns were affected by these laws, colonial legislation around the venereal diseases often predated and differed in profound ways from the British laws. 
domestic and colonial versions of contagious diseases legislation shared little more than a name, and sometimes not even a name, and a belief that forms of prostitution regulation were necessary for controlling this outburst of sexually, this, this epidemic, apparent epidemic of sexually transmissible diseases, particularly in military populations. Beyond that, the laws had little in common. And while ordinances and acts in different colonies could differ just as radically from one another as they did from the British model, those affecting colonies other than white settler colonies nonetheless shared some significant and telling characteristics. It is in the distinctive differences between the forms that contagious diseases legislation took in Britain and in most of its colonies, that deeply rooted assumptions about the critical relationship between sexuality and race emerge as key components in the structures of colonial rule. Formal contagious diseases legislation was actively pursued in Britain's Asian colonies, its African possessions, Labuan and North Borneo in the Malay archipelago, in the Japanese treaty ports, and in most of Car Britain's Caribbean and European territories between the 1850s and the late 1880s. So an incredible, incredible wide swath of places were affected by these kinds of laws. Prior to that, that is prior to the 1850s, informal versions of regulation had also flourished. The early Australian colonies used the criminal law and the principle of reclamation to control prostitution, though such a policy found far less sympathy in non-white colonies. More common in the latter were forms of regulation which tracked and treated infection in prostitute women without any significant discouragement of the sex trade. In Penang, for example, Governor Philip Dundas had created a red light district as early as the early 1800s. In the Malay Peninsula, a lock hospital, and a lock hospital isn't what it sounds like. It's a hospital that's used exclusively for the treatment of STDs in this period. A lock hospital was established at the start of the 19th century in Yogyakarta. India had extensive controls by the close of the 18th century. Lock hospitals funded by the East India Company had begun to appear late in the 18th century, and prostitution was regulated, albeit mostly on an informal and localized basis, by the early 1800s. Lock hospitals were in use in the Madras Presidency by 1805, and in the Bengal Presidency two years later. In 1827, William Burke, who was then Inspector General of Hospitals for the Army in India, outlined best practice for such regulatory systems. And this was the best practice. A register of prostitutes who agreed to fortnightly examination, certification for the healthy among them, and required hospitalization for the infected, and punitive measures in the shape of fines and incarceration for registered women failing to appear for their regular examination. What Burke described in 1827 was essentially the system which some 40 years later would form the core of the empire-wide system and which would be heralded wrongly as originating in Britain and sent out to the colonies. In fact, it's the other way around. The first formal scheme dedicated to these matters was promulgated not in Britain, but in Hong Kong, where an ordinance of 1857 significantly predated the first domestic British Contagious Diseases Act. Naval bases in the British Mediterranean boasted regulation by the early 1860s, and by the late 1870s, British colonies throughout the world, settler colonies, crown colonies, and protectorates alike, all the different forms of colonial rule that existed, all had such regulations on the books, as did Britain itself, where the first regulationist law, the Contagious Diseases, open brackets, women, close brackets, act, passed through Parliament in 1864. And just on the side, the reason for that bracketing is there was another bill passed at much the same time called the Contagious Diseases Open Brackets Cattle Close Brackets Act. And it was very important to be able to distinguish certain kinds of animals, as it were, from other kinds of animals. And that's really an, an extraordinary statement, I think, about what's happening in Britain that I'm not going to deal with today, and I'm sure your imaginations can take you there. Formalized statewide regulation came to India in the same year, that is 1864. The Cantonment Act allowed for the regulation and management of prostitutes in military cantonments. In some cases, fees were charged for the weekly or fortnightly examination of women who were also required to register themselves, usually with the magistrate, as licensed prostitutes. Lock hospitals, many of which were inherited from the East India Company's earlier experiments in this arena, compulsorily treated infected women on an inpatient basis, releasing them only when the medical staff were satisfied that they were free of venereal taint. 
In 1868, so four years later, the cities of British India were given license to introduce similar forms of registration and regulation under the Indian Contagious Diseases Acts. The major presidency cities, Madras, Calcutta, Bombay, as they were then known, rapidly moved in the direction of requiring women to register, to attend examination, and to accept treatment if found infected. When this legislation was discussed at the Governor General's Council early in 1868, however, members were appalled at the idea of handing over the power of registration to local police forces. Rejecting the reliance of the English law on police information, Henry Nas Sumner Main, the legal member of the Council, was, and I quote, convinced that such a system could not be introduced here, by which he meant India, without a risk of grievous oppression. Native police, he claimed, would use the opportunity afforded to bribe women and their worried menfolk. The act, in contrast to Britain, thus looked to the women and rejected the English principle. And here's what Bo uh, um, Maine had to say about this. Whereas, he said, in England, a superior officer of the police lays an information before a justice of a woman being a prostitute before any compulsory action can be taken in regard to her, the Indian Act makes it compulsory in the women themselves to come in for registration. The same principle informed the 1864 Cantonment Act in India. The onus of demanding to be registered lay with the women themselves. While the same practice held sway in the Chinese-dominated colonies of Hong Kong and the Strait Settlements, what we would call Singapore and the Malay Archipelago today, there, the rationale for self-regulation was subtly different from that of India. So in India, it's about the bribery by so-called native officials. Here's what they had to say about what would happen in the Chinese-dominated colonies, and this is from um, the administrator of the colonies at the time. Prostitution, he said, among the Chinese is not looked upon them by them in the same light as it, is, as it is by the Europeans, and those concerned in it are not considered infamous. The proprietor of a brothel is a merchant of a certain commodity and has very nearly the authority of a slave merchant over his stock in trade. And there is no doubt that he not only hires out his goods but disposes of or purchases them wherever he may find it advantageous to do so. Chinese women, then, were merely goods to be traded, no different from tea or cotton or opium. Yet neither in Britain nor in such white settler colonies as Australia and New Zealand did the law ever rely on women's, women registering under their own volition as prostitutes. Once brought before a magistrate, women were certificated, but that certification depended on their initial detention by the police on suspicion of prostitution. The registered prostitute in Britain and in the settler colonies was thus a woman with an arrest record, already regarded as criminal, while in the dependent colonies, prostitution occupied a completely different moral space. One, official, officials claimed, was not regarded by local cultures as criminal or deviant. In some ways, these were fabulously convenient arguments for colonial officials since they could do double duty. On the one hand, proving the absence of a stigma around prostitution in alien cultures, while on the other hand, allowing the laws to appear protective towards women who allegedly had no say, like the Chinese women, in their own fate. Yet at every moment, the justifications threatened to unravel on themselves, exposing the contradictions not so very far below the surface of these tricky debates about controlling colonial sexualities. After all, if regulation was to be justified as a protective measure, then the women surely had to be being protected from something. But if these were societies where prostitution was a routine activity, no more or less reviled than other occupations, then why was protection necessary? Obviously, in India, the argument was that corrupt Indian officials would bribe the respectable if given the chance. The commanding officer at Mysore warned, and I quote, that peons and chuprasses were employed as detectives or informers, and as usual, these functionaries made use of their power for extortion and all sorts of villainies. I will report that women in your house are diseased, and the doctors will come to inspect them. Seldom failed of eliciting a bribe, not to bring upon even respectable women and their families the disgrace of such a process. The very threat was sufficient to terrify the whole family into buying off such an indignity at whatever price the rascal who used it asked. He was pretty clear about his position. 
But this potential for bribery undermined the other stereotype at work here, that of the promiscuous colonial, unperturbed by the presence of prostitution as an ordinary workaday business. For the charge of bribery to be serviceable, it had to be shown vitiating probity. The allegedly natural avarice of the native depended on there being a class of respectable people on whom he, and it was he, could prey. Yet the degradation of native society, which the British claimed was universal, simultaneously erased the possibility of there being such a class of natives, seeing instead all natives as unrespectable. For one of the stereotypes to be worked, then the other had to be cast aside. And the contradictions hardly ended there. Self-registration, the British argued, was of no moral account in colonial settings. According to one Bombay chief of police, it's hardly an exaggeration to say that the great majority of India's inhabitants still regard prostitution and those who follow it with tolerance and sometimes even with respect and approval. Prostitution colonial officials all over Asia were fond of asserting offends no native susceptibility. It was living evidence of native disorder. Women could be called upon to register themselves, for there would be no shame in these colonies attached to their doing so. But this depiction of the cheerfully immoral and lewd native collapses in the face of competing representations of prudishness and respectability that the British also needed as a means to make sense of a slew of local customs and practices, not the least of which was female seclusion, regarded as widespread in many of Britain's Asian colonies. The idea of the abject Indian woman wrapped in veils and forbidden to leave her domestic jailhouse, or the hobbled Chinese woman unable to walk any distance because of her bound feet, was accepted as fact. The Daughters of India, wrote one British authority in the 1880s, were untaught in childhood, enslaved when married, accursed as widows, and unlamented at their death. The missionary W.G. Shelleber, giving testimony in the Straits settlements a, little, a few years later, asserted the absolutely typical view that by far the largest proportion of women have absolutely no voice in any matter in connection with their own lives. The colonial surgeon in the colony concurred, declaring that the Chinese women are not human beings, they're animals, partly from their being practically slaves, and partly from their utter lack of education and absolute indifference. They are inferior animals, he said. In such a context, the necessary tension between the expectation of self-registration within the Contagious Diseases Acts and a belief in the profound unfreedom of colonial women in thrall to their husbands and fathers and, of course, their brothel keepers undermine not just the operation of the regulationist laws, but more radically, the colonial sense of authority. Yet, highlighting the contradictions in this Victorian thinking is, you might argue, a cheap shot, an easy target. Certainly, it's not difficult to find the tears in the fabric of Victorian sensibility. But more, I think, is at stake here than simply showing how the Victorian establishment, for whom righteousness became an exquisite art form, could so easily trip over its own pronouncements. Rather, I want to use these contradictions to talk about the various and often amusing ways in which colonial women and men defied these views of their own societies, challenged the categorizations with which colonialism justified its surveillance and management of their sexuality, and frequently put to creative use the very chains used to bind them. I'm not invoking here a romantic and straightforward view of agency in which the underdog successfully throws off the colonial capitalist yoke. Resistance was in fact a double-edged sword which on occasion could backfire in serious ways and was by no means always successful. My interest instead is in putting aside a mode of thinking which pits success against defeat and looks rather at the unravelings of stereotype and category that I'm claiming was central to colonial rule in this period. That is, that those actions which we might dub resistance work here less as an explanation of why the system was ultimately abandoned as it was at the end of the 1880s than they do to highlight the constant and for the empire builders disturbing insecurities and instabilities definitional of imperial rule even as it continued to operate. 
Women frequently complained about the impact the regulation system had on their livelihood. The Lock Hospital officer at Bassein in Burma, which was administered, of course, as part of British India in the late 19th century, reported that women objected to registration because it reduced their potent potential customer base by requiring them to move to government-approved housing, essentially government brothels. The prostitutes, and I quote, have to move from their suitable lodgings to a place where there is less chance of getting a sufficient number of customers, the place in many cases being out of the way, more especially during the rainy season. Likewise, in the Bundelkhand district in, Indi in India, registered women complained that they were not sufficiently patronised by the soldiers, and they asked that measures might be taken to better their trade. Such cases suggest quite clearly that the women affected by the contagious diseases laws understood registration not as a shaming device, nor primarily as a mechanism for controlling them or for reigning in disease, but perhaps as a rational and contractual arrangement which secured them a soldier clientele in exchange for submitting to examination. That is, as a business arrangement in which they had room to negotiate. Simply put, their argument was that if the government wished them to move from recognised and familiar red light areas where business was reliable, it was surely also government's duty to redirect the flow of traffic such that business continued to flourish. In a similar vein, women also managed their time and profit by contracting services with one another. The registered women in Burma rented space in their quarters to unregistered prostitutes as a way to increase income. It was a logical arrangement, maintaining the, uh, the use of the premises and providing both parties with access to a living. Yet it horrified the local officials, who saw it, not surprisingly, as a threat to the entire system because there were unregulated women working on regulated premises. The use by the unregistered of premises otherwise associated with women under governmental control, in their eyes, served to undermine the system profoundly. But for the women, it was a logical extension of what they were all doing anyway. The conduct of the genital examinations was another topic on which affected women had much to say. Anti-regulation campaigners in Britain had, in the 1870s, seized upon the regular vaginal examination as the ultimate index of the act's immorality and brutality. Instrumental rape was how they characterised these medical checks on women, likening the speculum that was used to an unwanted and uninvited male member forcing itself on reluctant women. And of course, the fact of the examining doctors being men made the play upon violation all the more dramatic. In India, it was often the women themselves, rather than activist protesters uninvolved in the trade, who raised such issues, petitioning senior colonial officer, officials about their preference for examinations by women rather than by male doctors. Some complained that exams conducted by Indian doctors denigrated their status. Understanding the hierarchies of British practice, they recognised that examination at the hands of white men would raise their status considerably. Sometimes it was the treatments they received whilst in hospital that displeased them. Women confined in the Alipore Lock Hospital in 1875 protested to the Indian government about the poor treatment they felt they were receiving. And of course, tales of women who simply left hospital without permission or refused to enter hospital um, at all were commonplace. Small wonder that many lock hospitals sported barred windows, military guards, and punishment rooms for returned escapees. Indeed, more than a few lock hospitals were located in former jails or on the grounds of either prisons or insane asylums. In the straight settlements, according to the frustrated colonial governor, the ordinance was constantly foiled by the inmates absconding and the keepers of the brothels closing their houses and professing to retire from their occupation. Reports from both the Straits and Hong Kong constantly spoke of the existence of innumerable unregistered and thus illegal brothels, assiduously avoiding the net of state surveillance. Some at least of these unregistered brothels was simply a case of women sharing premises and pooling resources, where there would have been no cruel brothel keeper collecting a profit, but rather a collective of women cooperatively earning a livelihood. Women also found ingenious ways to avoid the system altogether, while still securing a living uh, from the sale of sex. They adopted imaginative schemes to avoid examination by simulating menstruation, by changing their names, or by sending along another woman in their stead. Those who preferred to avoid examination and regulation often used aliases to avoid registration. 
Unsurprisingly, and in keeping with familiar stereotypes we've already discussed, officials also claimed that women bribed native hospital assistants to exempt them from inspection. In Calcutta, in the early 1870s, enterprising women dressed in men's clothes in order to gain access to the soldiers' barracks where they plied their trade. In Agra, a group of women successfully evaded registration for a day or two by wearing European clothes. Ruses such as these indicate that women understood quite precisely how the racial colonial classification in this regulation system worked. Some contested the laws using the colonial state's own mechanisms. The superintendent of the Calcutta Lock Hospital spoke of women who employ counsel to defend them. And there were similar reports from elsewhere in the country. At Bellari in southern India in 1875, one woman successfully appealed her registration to the High Court. This mass of evidence implies far more than just resistance. Each occasion, I would argue, on which women challenged the system also contradicted the image of Asian women as passive and biddable. The act of resistance of women to the irksome rules laid down by regulation really doesn't square with the picture of helpless and terrified women unable to make decisions on their own behalf or cowed by cruel employers into silence and submission. The often imaginative ways in which colonial women reworked their encounters with authority on the one hand frustrated any possibility of a smooth working for the regulation system and on the other fed colonial prejudice regarding the intransigence of the native in the face of what the colonials argued were rational systems. Yet many of the women's responses were clearly rational, employing the machinery of the state to the fullest, hiring lawyers and memorialising government are perfect examples. Knowledge about native practice as a result had constantly to be remade and in ways which would read palpably rational responses as anything but, as examples instead of diso disorder and uncooperativeness rather than as considered alternatives and challenges. One interesting example, interesting example of this business-like approach with which many in the sex industry approach their work in the, is the brothel club system, which developed in the Malay archipelago after the compulsory examination of women was formally abandoned at the end of the 1880s. Mindful both of the advantages of controlling STDs and of a voluntary association with colonial officials, a number of brothels in the Strait settlements contracted with local colonial doctors for a private version of what had previously been state policy, regular examinations and prompt treatment for sexually transmissible diseases. This was a voluntary system in which brothel keepers hired a doctor to conduct regular inspections to treat infected women and to hospitalize them when necessary. Brothels paid per woman, a small fee per woman, and the doctors both received the sick in their clinics and made private visits to the brothels. The first of these new ventures involved the Japanese brothels, they were all racially segregated, on Singapore's Malay Street, whose workers were inspected by T.C. Mugliston, the colonial surgeon. The plan would develop, as you will see in a moment, into a full-scale government scandal in the early years of the 20th century. For the doctors thus employed were, of course, also public servants and representatives of the colonial project. The doctors insisted that their involvement was at the invitation of the women, though there is no doubt that they traded on their state positions and on the familiarity of the now defunct contagious diseases system in the colonial brothel world. Mugliston's second arrangement was with the Chinese brothels in Singapore from 1893. He set up four medical clubs for Cantonese women alongside a private hospital where those requiring treatment were sent. Medications were provided at a discount from the government dispensary to which as a colonial surgeon he had, of course, access. The Straits governor, supportive of the plan, made a point of checking with the colonial office as to the legitimacy of this rather interesting scheme. And the system was permitted to stand as long as Mugliston did not treat the women on government premises or identify his official position when issuing certificates claiming that the women were free of disease. By 1894, few Singapore brothels did not subscribe to these schemes, and brothel clubs be rapidly became common throughout the Strait Settlements, operated almost entirely by government doctors, and thus raising the spectre of a return to the old contagious diseases laws, which had been technically prohibited in the late 1880s after well-organized and far-reaching protests. By 1907, the Chinese brothel club in Kuala Lumpur 
run by the state surgeon at Selangor, a man called Dr. Travers, had more than 700 subscribers. Travers rented space for a dispensary and a hospital offering separate wards for Chinese and Japanese women. Hospitals open too in Kuala Lumpur and in Ipo and Parak run as private enterprises by doctors in government employee, employ. For the women on the, examining, in the, on the examination table, little really changed. They were examined by the same men on the same rotation and the same fee changed hands. When the system had been a state enterprise, the doctors mandated to examine sex workers had frequently complained that they were being required to do dirty work. But its appeal as a private trade soon became obvious. There was very good money to be made. At the height of his business, Travers brought in about $1,000 a month from his brothel club work. As a result, in some places, and particularly in Kinta District in the Federated Malay States, competition between government medical officers over brothel practice became quite common, and this led to an official inquiry in 1907. Dr. Duncan Cooper, the inquiry heard, and I quote, entered into a profit-sharing association with two low-class Asiatic practitioners, one a Chinese and the other a Japanese, most discreditable and highly unbecoming for a government medical officer. Tellingly, one official at the colonial office thought the clubs indistinguishable from oriental squeeze of the vilest nature, work which no decent medical man would soil his hands with. The doctors complained that their government salaries were low and that their rights to private practice were fair compensation for their poor official pay. Civil surgeons were commonly permitted private practice to bolster their state remuneration, though there was long-standing tension over the arrangement. Rather than call attention to the embarrassing proximity of these brothel club schemes to the reviled contagious disease, disease system, it was politic to make the debate, the official debate, turn, at least for public consumption, instead on doctors' neglect of their duties in favour of these brothel clubs. And in 19, 1907, September 1907, following the inquiry at Kinta, the Straits Governor forbade employers in his jurisdiction from engaging in brothel practice. As it spread, the brothel club was a business deeply embarrassing to the government in a host of ways. Not only did it make politicians vulnerable to accusations that the now derided regulation system ditched after major protests had been re-established in underhand and unofficial ways, but with official sanction, but it tarnished notions of colonial morality and righteousness and undermined the stark division drawn between colonial greed and unscrupulousness and British respectability. It was colonial doctors, after all, after all who were competing for this really very well-paid trade. Government doctors were once more examining marginalised women for stigmatised diseases and worse, were engaged in what the report called a most unbecoming fight for business. Interestingly, the brothel club model seems to have been unique to the Malay archipelago. I found no evidence of such arrangements in any other colonial setting. In some senses, this is surprising, in part because the compulsory system was prohibited virtually empire-wide from the late 1880s, and in part because colonial doctors everywhere complained, complained bitterly about the paucity of their earnings and eagerly sought out promising arenas for private practice. The dominance of the brothel as the focal point of the straight sex trade is not an, a sufficient explanation for in other major colonies, India, Hong Kong, elsewhere. The brothel was also the principal conduit for the sex trade. The demographics of the trade also look similar across colonial settings. Women from impoverished parts of Asia, such as the Canton Delta and Amakusa Island, Japan, fetched up in brothels throughout the empire, often following the patterns of migration established by the male labourers who were their principal, though by no means exclusive clientele. What may account for the difference at the Straits is the support offered these brothel club schemes, at least initially, by the Chinese protectorate, whose very raison d'etre embraced a gendered and a racial reading of the Chinese sex trade as more problematic, more coercive, more unacceptable than other manifestations even with, within allegedly immoral Asia. What I think puts this curious system into motion is a reading of Chinese and, to a lesser extent, Malay sexualities as particularly and definitively, definitively dangerous, a threat to colonial stability that had to be curbed however possible. As a postscript 
to the brothel club scandal, a number of the doctors whose businesses were curtailed claimed compensation for the loss of income. And though these claims were denied, not surprisingly, by the colonial authority, the accused were in no manner penalised for their indiscreet activities. There's an extraordinary memo dated June 1908 in which a senior colonial official outlined some of the options considered for dealing with these somewhat discredited men, and I quote, the Straits Governor, he said, asks that Mr Birch, who was one of the doctors implicated in the Kentish scandal, may be transferred or retired on pension. I do not see where he could be transferred to. The governor suggested that he should be made governor of Tasmania, where he could do no mischief. It's difficult to believe that this suggestion was made seriously. Possibly Mr Birch would do no great harm as commissioner of Waihewai or governor of the Falklands. But though there are no doubt precedents for promoting a man because he is an intolerable nuisance, the principle seems a bad one and not fair to the colony, which has to receive him. In fact, it happened all the time. Stubbs, the author of the memo, may have looked askance at such suggestions, but the memo serves as a reminder of the unfathomable gulf between the future of even an officially tarnished colonial public servant who could be considered for a governorship of a colony and the women who worked in Asian brothels and whose clientele included more than a few colonising men. What then? can we take away from the brothel club scandal and from the system it was designed to replace? I want to suggest not only, as I've argued elsewhere, that these, pra these practices quite obviously reveal derogatory attitudes towards Asian sexualities and that this diminishment of Asian cultures is a major plank in imperial policy, but that there is here as well a parallel critique around the conduct of business which helped consolidate the critique of Asian sexualities. The vision of the oppressive brothel as a form of slavery overseen by vicious taskmasters invited an implicit comparison with the proper business practices of civilized commerciality which emphasized freedom of labor and of opportunity. The Asian brothel, as understood by colonial officials, violated every Western commercial norm. It tied women to keepers through debt bondage. It severely constrained mobility. It substituted enslavement for waged work. It involved women, God forbid, as contractors. And the brothel itself, of course, made public activities that belonged properly in the private realm. Business the province of the West and the supreme mark of civilization was, was disturbingly reworked in Asia, sexualized, feminized, perhaps even emasculated. Along the way, as the Kinta scandal revealed, Westerners could become contaminated by this blurring of fundamental principles that kept sex in the bedroom and business in the boardroom, women in the domestic and men in the public sphere. Asian sexualities, with their rejection of this fundamental Western binary, had to be regulated, had to be controlled if colonialism was to, to survive. Sex was fundamental to imperial governance, and commercial sex above all, which turned business on its head by making public that which belonged in the private and challenging the proprieties and hierarchies of colonial pr principles, vividly revealed the fault lines of empire. Reading prostitution as commonplace and unremarkable in Asian cultures was a clear marker of the sexual inferiority of colonial societies. But when, as was so palpably the case in the vigorous brothel culture of the Southeast Asian colonies in the 19th and early 20th centuries, that th trade threatened to disrupt Western readings of how commerce operated, the problem was compounded. Colonial sexualities read over and over as fecund, lustful and cruel were also and dangerously destabilizing. If an older tradition of imperial history has sometimes left us with a sense that power emanated only, only from the center, then these off-center considerations suggest a larger, more fragmented, and surely more satisfyingly complex picture of the workings of colonialism, which require examining not just British, but local practice, opinion and thought, not merely as a way to celebrate or highlight resistance to colonial rule, but as an undisputed element of the very play of colonial forces. Sex was a part of the politics of empire, 
And when we incorporate such practices as the regulation of prostitution and its myriad consequences into our understanding of the workings of politics, then the imperial picture expands and changes. Aspirations to control and to change non-Western sexualities were vital components of imperial rule. Colonial governments actively legislated in these areas with the support of the imperial parliament in London. The control of sexual practices was not only central, it was also definitive. Bad sex, wrong sex, deviant sex defined, described and characterised those in need of the civilising hand of colonialism. The argument of altruism that a British presence was an educative, progressive and civilising force in primitive or degraded societies made the control of sexuality not just acceptable but imperative. The regulation and management of sex were, a key, were key to maintaining and perpetuating the idea and the practice of British supervision over colonial subjects. In the end then, I hope that what I've offered here is less a British than a variously imperial story, one in which rule and authority were never simple, were always contested, and in which, in this instance, the view from the colonies affects also the view of the colonies. For I would argue that it is only in such sharings and cross-currents that we can understand deeply the global ramifications of imperialism. And it is only when we allow our attention to turn to questions once considered peripheral to the allegedly real workings of power, in this instance, sexuality and disease, that we will hear and heed many a submerged voice and practice and be in a position to read across and between rather than down the imperial lines. Thank you. I'm very happy to take questions, but I have to blow my nose first. <laughs> I'm sorry. By the way, there's a reception afterwards. <laughs> I forgot to tell you. Can you hear that? Yeah. So there's a mic that's yep. around. Like Hello. Um, thank you very much. I, I was curious if you found, um, in you, you're talking about contagious uh, diseases acts that were localized, but were there at the same time efforts to um, monitor mobility between um, these locations, um, both across and in and out of Britain? Absolutely, absolutely. There's enormous fears of women moving between the colonies, partly, of course, because um, then you wouldn't know who they were or where they were, and you wouldn't be able to keep, keep a hold of them. But there's also tremendous fears of European women um, coming to the colonies to work in brothels, particularly, that's particularly focused on Jewish women um, coming out of um, Eastern Europe in uh, the time of the pogroms. Um, and they are going to various places. They're going to Egypt, they're going to India, they're going to Shanghai, they're going all over the place. And there's immense fears particularly about that group of women because they, um, they're liminal, they're not quite native and they're not quite white, they're Jewish, they're Eastern European, they're foreign, they're all of those things, but they can pass as white and they sell themselves in that way. And there's an enormous fear that if white women are practicing prostitution um, in the colonial arena, that you will no longer be able to distinguish between the respectable white woman and the not respectable white woman. And that ha there's tremendous anxiety around that, as you might imagine, which leads to miscegenation laws um, and um, those kinds of things early in the 20th century in a number of different colonies. So yes, there's, there's tremendous, and the other point about mobility, the other anxiety about mobility, of course, is that if women move around, then that probably means they're not registering and they're not registered. And so it has that potential to undermine the system as well. So yes, the 
the, the mobility of women is a really incredibly important question for this. Absolutely, no question about it, both within a military and a non-military context and across different kinds of racial divides. At the same time, there is, we know, tr there is a tremendous amount of migrant sex work in this period. Women from Japan, um, women from China, moving around um, particularly the Southeast Asian colonies, but also into South Africa. Um, uh, and, and it's interesting because as a result of those kinds of migrations, you also see interesting classifications of the brothels, uh, first class brothels being brothels people by white, white, by white women or um, affecting or having a, a, a white clientele. Um, and then second class brothels being Japanese women who are considered to be cleaner and more respectable than other kinds of non-white women and so forth and so on. So you get these amazing racial hierarchies um, that come out of this tremendous amount of migration. But a large part of female migration in the late 19th century is as a result of the sex industry. There's, there's no question about that. The other um, anxiety that happens early in the 20th century is when um, white Russians in particular, um, as Russia starts to kind of disintegrate in the early 20th century, um, the old Russian Empire starts to disintegrate, people will start to move and a lot of women because it's really not very far, relatively speaking, end up in places like Shanghai, Beijing, Canton, and those kinds of places, and they repre re represent themselves as American women. And the American consulate gets very, very upset about this and writes um, tendentious letters to the British um, saying, we have to do something about this. We have to stop Russian women from pretending that they're Americans. They knew that they could charge more if they, um, if they uh, represented themselves as Americans. So yeah, mobility is hugely important. Down the front here. I just would like to hear a word on your sources and uh, if the CD Acts also addressed issues of male or child prostitution. The CD Act, that's a very interesting question. The CD Act, no, they, they, they deal with neither child prostitution nor male prostitution. There are, there's almost no law that deals with male prostitution. It's something the British Blanche even to, you know, to think about. Child prostitution is dealt with in, in um, not really dealt with formally, but, but the age of consent legislation, there's a lot of colonial and domestic age of consent legislation which tries to deal with that, although it's not specifically about prostitution, it's the age at which young women um, can have sex. So that's how that is dealt with. The CD laws are specifically and only a site at which the female prostitute is recognized as, seen as the person who transmits STDs, and there's no question about that. That's, that literally is all that these acts do. They, they're not really addressing prostitution so much as they're addressing disease. These acts are about disease, hence the name of them. So that's why you don't really see those kinds of things uh, addressed, particularly in a period in which it's still not uncommon for the idea, it's an 18th century idea, but it, but it c continues to exist in the 19th century, that, um, that one way to cure things like syphilis is to have um, sexual congress with a, with a young um, female virgin. So, you know, those things are not really addressed in those ways. Sources, well, lots and lots and lots and lots, um, and, and a, a real, a really incredible range of sources for a project like this. Military records, medical records, um, social purity records from um, movements that were dedicated to expunging this kind of legislation from the books. Um, feminist activists, the, 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 the works of feminist activists, the papers of feminist activists, lots and lots of government papers dealing with this kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, you pick it up in strange ways, but there's a cornucopia of different kinds of resources, both in formal and uh, formal governmental archives and in less formal ways. There's also, of course, all of the, the kind of journal stuff in things like medical journals, um, feminist journals, political journals in the period. It gets picked up by the press. Um, because this is a huge political issue in Britain. There is, um, at various points throughout the 1870s, 1880s, and even into the 1890s, there are moments when this becomes literally constitutional crisis. There's a moment in the 1890s when the um, Governor General of India sends a telegram back to the India Secretary in London saying, constitutional crisis about to happen here, and it's about this issue. Um, they're being accused of... of, of, of the issue of bringing back acts that, that have been banned. So this is, this is a political hot potato. Um, and that means that there is um, there's stuff at the highest levels. Um, but also, there's also quite a lot of good ephemera. Um, there are various kinds of pamphlets and leaflets and 
you know, all of those kinds of things, trial records, um, legal records, court records, it, the list goes on. Sources are fantastic for, for this project and sometimes frustrating. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, there, there are a couple of linked questions that arise that um, that occur to me. One, you mentioned, not surprisingly, that the you know that a large part of the clientele is is military. Yeah. But the British Army, or what the British and the Colonial Office use as army, is itself a mixed bag of multiple yep. races. Yep. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm wondering how, uh, in the first instance, how, how mm -hmm. the medical treatment mm -hmm. of the 20% of yeah. military uh, personnel who are infected yeah. was racialized, hier hierarchicalized, and yeah. so forth, whether the same doctors are treating the men as the women right. and so forth. The okay. other is that, um, and I have only two examples to call on, but uh, one of the first acts of the uh, Allied occupation of Japan yeah. was to secure houses of prostitution yeah. to service the occupation uh, staff. And there's a, a quarter in Seoul that, uh, until the American military base was turned back to the Koreans, serviced the mm -hmm. American military. Before that, it serviced the Korean mili the Japanese mm -hmm. imperial military, mm -hmm. and before that, mm -hmm. well back into the 17th and 16th centuries, uh, it serviced the Korean mm -hmm. uh, military. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering what the role of the military is in organizing prostitution to keep the troops, as it were, happy. Your second question, of course, is pertinent even in a contemporary context. I mean, we know that this is happening today. I mean, you know, in South Korea, in the Philippines, all over the place. There's some very good uh, material that's been written about this this kind of thing. I'm thinking of the work of people like Catherine Moon um, and others who've written specifically about these kinds of things. I mean, there is no question. Um, and the Americans, of course, were doing it in the Second World War, uh, where they had uh, brothels in Hawaii. Even while prostitution was criminal in the rest of the country, there were wartime brothels for soldiers in Hawaii, which had doors on separate sides of the building for black GIs and white GIs so that there wouldn't be race riots. Beth, Beth Bailey and David Farber have written beautifully about that kind of thing. So the military angle, I think, is, is just so central to understanding this, which is why, of course, military records were also so fabulous for, for my purposes. In terms of your first question, um, it is, in fact, the same doctors, for the most part, who are treating both um, the soldiers and the women, because this is something that is done through the, mi the medical military corps. What's interesting, though, as you pointed out, many of the, of the soldiers, of course, are not white soldiers, uh, particularly in India before, 18, before 1860. Um, when you know you have a very large East India Company army. What's very interesting, uh, that, that's less the case in the other colonies that I was looking at, but what's very interesting about that is that there is a notion, on the, and this gets rehearsed by colonial officials all the time, a notion that those soldiers are in fact less likely to contract um, sexually transmissible diseases. And there's a number of reasons that are put forward for this. It's very interesting because, again, it contradicts the stereotype of the licentious native. So the, these, these stereotypes are constantly being undermined by themselves, you know, which is quite interesting. But what they're arguing is these men are in their own country. For the most part, they are married. They are also subject to the disapproval um, and, and the surveillance that come with living in your own communities. Precisely what they were saying didn't exist, suddenly exists when it's convenient for it to do so. But the, but the big difference, of course, was that whilst almost all of the soldiery, the British soldiery, were unmarried, because you couldn't, only 6% of the strength could marry, that was the, 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 the rule in Britain, most of these um, sepoys, as they were called, were married men, and so the assumption was that they were, and, and they didn't, and they didn't live in barracks. They lived with their families because they were generally <coughs> working, uh, except obviously when they were off on a on a campaign. They were at home essentially, and so the the the, the, the idea was that they weren't in fact getting. Um, STDs at the same rate. Now, I think they also were not being tested assidu as, as assiduously. Um, and I think in this period, we, it would not be unfair to say that medics find what they're looking for to a large extent. I mean, this is a per period in which it's worth remembering that venereal diseases are essentially dermatological diseases at this point. That's how they're understood. There's no blood test at this point. Pathology and histology is an early 1900s. You know, it, it emerges very early in the 1900s. In the 19th century, the only way that you can diagnose is 
is a visual examination of the genitalia. And of course, the problem with that is that syphilis, on the one hand, has latent phases. Gonorrhea is asymptomatic in women. So we got a lot of problems with, with, uh, with this. The other problem was they didn't understand the cyclical nature of syphilis. And so the diagnosis of primary syphilis in this period is incredibly inaccurate because very often what they're actually diagnosing is secondary syphilis. Um, and they're calling it primary because they're not you know, quite understanding these relationships. So we don't really know what percentage of either the white or the, the, the Indian soldiers had, in fact, these diseases, or indeed of the women for that matter. But there is, I think, no question that, that they're looking harder at the women and at the white soldiers than they are at the other soldiers, just as in the Chinese populated colonies, in the Straits and in Hong Kong, where it's less a military than a civilian set of laws that you have. There is absolutely no surveillance, and I mean absolutely no surveillance, of those brothels that service local men. The surveillance is of the so-called first-class brothels, where the clientele is either white military or other kinds of, of, of white, um, white folk of various kinds. They could be merchants, they could be traders, they could be all sorts of people. There is no surveillance of those brothels which have an exclusively Asian clientele. So, you know, you get what you, 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 you find what you're looking for at some level, I think, in those respects. So it's, it's a very interesting. Hello. Um, yes, I have a question if the venereal diseases that you have... You need to speak into the microphone. Sorry, thank thank is you. that better? <laughs> Much better, thank you. Um, I have a question if the venereal diseases that um, you were examining in your study had any um, influence or played into any relationship of the British construction of tropical diseases as a medical category? Yes, very much so, very much so. It's a great question. Um, yes, they are, of course, a different kind of disease um, in many ways, but there, is, there are often notions that get put forward in mostly, um, well, mixture of metropolitan and colonial medical journals that forms of venereal disease or STDs that one finds in tropical colonies in particular are more virulent um, and more dangerous and um, much harder to cure than would be the case for what were seen as the milder versions that might, that might accrue um, in more temperate climates. So there's a, there's a kind of environmental way in which they're seen. There's also, of course, the real problem that there are, of course, forms of um, they're, they're, you know, things like yours and pinta and other kinds of tropical diseases, which um, can be confused with syphilis very, very easily. Um, they all come from the same family of organisms. So there's, there's, a, there's a real problem there, and so there's a, and a connection to tropical disease through that, um, which is quite important. The other issue is leprosy, which of course is also seen as increase, increasingly seen in this period as a tropical disease. It hadn't been, but it is becoming a tropical disease and being associated as one in this period. Syphilis, particularly in its tertiary form, often looks a little bit like or can look a little bit like leprosy. So that's another area of overlap. And so a lot of the doc doctors involved in tropical medicine are kind of picking up on these kinds of, of issues and trying to sort of think about what those sets of relationships might be. It doesn't get taken up by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, because they are fully aware that, in fact, this is not a tropical disease. But amongst doctors um, who are not highly specialized in that way, there is a notion that, yes, these you know, these, these have a, a kind of tropical, um, there's a kind of confluence of tropical stuff that's going on that makes them a different kind of disease. The specialists, less, much less so, much less so. But yes, there's no question that that, that gets played, particularly in the, earlier in the century, before they really begin to understand the nature of tropical diseases more deeply. There's definitely a way. Um, and in, in Africa in the late 18th century, after the kind of scramble for Africa, when they really start to see things like yours and Pinta in much, much greater numbers. These, these are endemic diseases. Um, but at that point, the difference between endemic and epidemic isn't really fully understood. That's another problem that we do see. So um, these kinds of diagnostics are, are quite important, I think, in the period, yeah. Um, right there, yeah. Um, I, have, I have read a little bit about this, but not extensively at all. And I was wondering if you could give me a bit more of a background on how they rationalized um, domestic white prostitutes in Britain? Well, <laughs> it's complicated. Prostitution has never been illegal in Britain. 
certain parts of the process are and have been illegal. It is illegal to solicit for business, but it is not illegal to engage in an act of prostitution, and never has been. So there's a, there's a kind of long history of a certain, a, a sort of qualified libertarianism, if you like, in the British system. It was always stigmatized, and so women who practiced prostitution, women who, who were part of the sex industry were, of course, marginal figures, unless, of course, they were the mistresses of very wealthy people, and then their marginalization kind of works you know, in slightly different ways. But it's never been something that was criminalized in Britain. Brothel, uh, keeping a brothel was illegal. So there are different ways in which these kinds of things happen. One of the reasons for that, I think, is I mean, part of it, I think, is that there is a rhetoric about liberty in Britain, which clearly gets undermined by everything that's happened in the colonies. But there is a rhetoric, I think, about a certain kind of liberty. Um, I think the second reason for it is that there is a real refusal, and this is not unique to Britain, but there's a real refusal to recognize prostitution as a form of work. And therefore, in a sense, you're not going to, you're not going to put it into the, into the same bag, if you like, as, that, as, as the legal bag where contracts belong and where regulation belongs and all of those kinds of things, because if you did that, then you would have recognized it as being, in some way, an occupation, a real occupation, as opposed to something unfortunate that shouldn't happen. When you do that, then you've accepted it as a form of work, and I think there's a real resistance to accepting prostitution as a form of work in Britain, because it didn't belong in the public sphere. So a lot of it has to do with the particular ways in which I think British culture in this period buys into a public-private sphere divide as being a really critical place to kind of categorize how people, people are. So I think there's all of that going on, but it isn't wholly acceptable, right? Because it is illegal to keep a brothel, it is illegal to solicit. Um, and there are also, the, 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 the main law that actually most people get picked up on in Britain for, uh, in terms of prostitution is actually vagrancy. It's, it's hanging around on the street corner is what gets you picked up. Um, and you get picked up for loitering um, or for vagrancy. So it's not, it's a complicated situation that you have in Britain. But I'm not for a minute suggesting that it's, that it's acceptable in Britain. Um, but it's seen, and there is language in the first Contagious Diseases Act, 1864, which says this is, this is an unfortunate trade and a vile trade, but it's a necessary trade. And it was regarded as necessary because the other thing, of course, that's going on in this period that I think is, is again, central to the public-private divide thing is the idea that men's sexuality is of a very particular kind, and that the, the, the natural way for men to behave is to want to have a lot of sex. And that because women don't want to do that, because the naturalization of women is that they are passive sexually, and this is, a, this is really a relatively new notion at this point, right? I mean, in the medieval period, women are held from the waist down. In this period, that changes, and women become these kind of passive, you know, lie back and think of England um, kinds of, of, of ciphers. So, so if you're going to naturalize male sexuality as something which needs constant attention, that needs to be to be dealt with in those ways, then vile though prostitution may be, it is necessary because it's that which keeps rape and the violation of respectable women from happening. So better to sacrifice marginal women than to risk the violation of respectable women. So there's a class angle, I think, as well, that helps explain the British. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm going to ask you a question that goes back to one of your first couple of sentences. Um, you mentioned new imperial history and said that you were somewhat uncomfortable with that category. And I was hoping that you could um, elaborate on that comment and speak a little bit about your work and where it fits in historiography and the history of, of empire. Right. I, I, I'm hoping that the paper generally made clear that I'm not, I'm very uncomfortable with binaries. I see binaries as, I mean, that's precisely what I'm trying, you know, not to, and, and so new imperial history for me, the problem with it is it sets up a binary between the notion of an old imperial history and a new imperial history. And you know, there's a lot of old imperial history that's awfully good. Um, you know, one thinks of Eric Williams, one thinks of all sorts of people. So I'm un uncomfortable with the term because I think that it, it, 
it sets up um, a conflict, it sets up a binary that I don't think is necessarily the case. There is dull history and there is interesting history, I guess that's a binary. Um, but that's a very different one, it seems to me, than new and old. So I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the term simply because it seems to me that it, it denigrates a lot, it potentially denigrates a lot of work that, that I have no interest in, in denigrating. So I, 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 that's, you know, I use the term because there really isn't another term that I can use there. But I just wanted to kind of register that it's not a term that I would choose to use if an alternative that didn't do that were available to me. In terms of my, where I am, I, I mean, my interest, and I suppose this would be not atypical of, of the so-called new imperial history generally, I'm really interested in trying to think about the ways in which British history, if such a thing exists as a topic, changes if one insists that the imperial project is always part of the way that one thinks about. If you're a modernist, this is, it seems to me that this, is, this has to be the case, that one can't think about this thing called domestic Britain without thinking about imperial Britain too. That is, there's no such thing, if you like, as domestic Britain. Then, then in a sense, that is a, a, a kind of fantasy that's been, that, that, that has a very particular political role to play in the way that Britain, I think, fashions itself today and has fashioned itself at least for 100 years. And so for me, it's about the interest, is bringing together what used to be seen as domestic and imperial Britain as if they were two separate entities that really didn't have very much to do with one another. And what I'm interested in is the way that they actually are part of something that speaks to a whole host of, of stuff that's going on in this period around particular kinds of political power and knowledge, um, the particular ways in which the rise of nationalism and different kinds of nationalist identities get forged in this period, because they're very central, it seems to me, to the kind of late 18th, you know, the period from the late 18th century onward, and all of these kinds of questions. So I suppose, in a nutshell, it's about the ways, it, it's about a refusal to think about Britain as if it is something that, A, is a fixed category that exists sort of outside of history, because it doesn't, it's a historical construction with a, with, a, with a particular politics, and politics that changes over time, right? that it's contingent in those kinds of ways. So it's a refusal to think about Britain as a fixed category and a refusal to think about the nation as a fixed category, and trying to see whether bringing in these kinds of global and transnational and cross-colonial ways of rethinking that, what that does, if you like, to that notion of what constitutes Britain at any given moment. Yeah? Will that do? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.